International Franchise Association's Women's Franchise Committee podcast, Her Success, the Stories of Female Franchise Leaders. I am Emma Dickinson, the CEO and President with Home Helpers Home Care, and today I have the honor of speaking with legendary franchise leader, acclaimed author, and motivational speaker, Dina Dwyer Owens, former chairwoman and CEO of Neighborly. Dina is a certified franchise executive with more than 30 years of industry experience, having grown up in the Dwyer Group, now neighborly, founded by her father, Don. Dina has served as the longest tenured CEO and chairwoman and MET board member, and now neighborly includes more than 27 brands with over 5,000 franchisees in domestic and international markets. Dina is known for building legendary teams to scale. In her career, Dina has always had a strong desire to serve and pay it forward. She has been a long-standing member of the International Franchise Association, having led the association as chair in 2010. She was awarded the Bonnie Levine Award in 2002 for her work mentoring other women to be successful in franchise leadership roles. She was awarded the Crystal Compass Award from the Women's Franchise Committee in 2011 and was inducted in the IFA Hall of Fame in 2022. Dina has lived her personal and professional life in service to others, keeping values front and center. She wrote Live Rich, highlighting how to live out your code of values in 2005 and followed that up with Values Inc., focusing on how to live right and do the right thing in business and in life. Dina has encouraged and set an example for thousands of others focused on work, family, and relationships, all the while being a daughter, a working wife and mother, an aunt, a grandmother, a friend, a mentor, and a woman of faith. Welcome, Dina, and it is such an honor to get to spend this time with you today. I am one of the thousands that has benefited from your work over the many years. And I am so glad that our audience is going to get to know you better. I highlighted the awards you've received at the IFA over the years. And I'm proud to say, although you didn't know me back then, I was in the audience for every single one of them and truly inspirational for me. Wow, Emma. No, I had no idea. What I remember is you being with me um, at an IFA summer board meeting when I was riding a bike and I got a little too aggressive and I got cut up pretty good. So <laughs> I know you were there, but yeah, I was there amazing to, to hear. Yeah. And thank you for having me today. Well, like you, I've spent 30 years in the industry and I'm very happy with the, the work that I've been able to do. And I've learned from many women such as yourself and Melanie Bergeron and Catherine Monson, uh, Joyce Mazzaro, the list goes on and on. So truly is an honor to get to spend some time with you. Um, you know, for our listeners, I thought it would be a, a good opportunity. You know, we've connected uh, some over the last few years. And one of the things I learned is that you and I both grew up in the family business. And as children, we began working in that family business at very early ages. So when you think back, and I know for me, it was one of the best things my family could have done for me. So for you, can you tell us a little bit about those experiences? And more importantly, what were the top three most valuable lessons you learned? Oh, wow. Yes. Getting started young um, was invaluable. And I didn't like it when I was 12 years old. I didn't get to do the slumber parties with my friends every weekend. Instead, I'd be at the car wash at eight in the morning, right? And uh, working, selling uh, car washes and pumping gas and selling detail jobs. My dad always had me at the the front line, right? Always learning how to sell. So uh, yeah, looking back, it was such a, a great gift that he gave me and my five siblings uh, to put us to work at a very early age. And so the greatest lessons I think were number one is love is leadership. <laughs> I think that what I learned from observing my father, even though he was he was one who definitely uh, gave you tough love, but he loved everybody that worked for him. And he believed in the untapped potential of every human being that he worked with. So really loving those around you. And and my definition of love, or the one that I borrowed from Thomas Aquinas is um, love is to do, uh, to will the good of another. So, you know, my mind, there's no reason not to love every single person because we want 
what's good for everybody. Um, number two is to have a, a clear set of values. So even at that young age of 12, my father had clarity of what his values were and was indoctrinating those into me and my five siblings. So to have clarity of your values. And then I think number three is to know who you are and not be afraid um, to, to be you. I've heard so many women um, in my lifetime, and, and actually I've been in the business for almost 39 years, but so many women who talk about all the challenges, all the things that are just so hard. And if that's all you think about, you know what? It's going to be hard. And all you're going to do is make it harder for yourself. So really believing in myself. And I was around male-dominated businesses all of my life. You know, so even when I was doing public relations, when we were a publicly traded company, I was around mostly men. And the, the benefit to that was there was no line at the women's bathroom. So I think all the <laughs> women would appreciate that. Um, but I was just surrounded by men. And if I ever let myself go down that trail of I'm being treated differently or I can't make it in this man's world or whatever the negative things are that we, we bring to our own minds sometimes, I probably wouldn't have made it. But instead, I said, I know who I am. I know what I'm good at. I know what the customer wants. So if I just focus on those things and I surround myself with a bunch of other great people who fill the gaps, I'm going to be just fine. Yeah, that, that is so true. And like you, grew up in a male-dominated, while home care certainly is it franchising at the time was. And I can remember one of my first conferences going to the annual leadership conference that the Women's Franchise Committee uh, still today is a you know sellout event. And looking around the room, at that time, only women could come. Now it's certainly we welcome all who want to learn more about leadership. But there were 30 people in the room. And Julia Stewart at the time was with IHOP and she was the right. featured speaker. I was there that year that you were uh, our keynote speaker. And just the lessons that you learn and, and you know, it to me, it all does come down to believe in yourself, have a great attitude and work hard. That's one of the That's lessons right. I learned from my family business is work hard. And if you work hard, good things will happen. Um, and I'm so I was just saying family businesses too, you know, so many people think, believe things are handed to us. Well, I know it wasn't the case for you and it certainly was not the case for me. So working hard was critical because we wouldn't want anybody to think that anything was handed to us. That would make me feel good as a leader, right? I have to earn my position. And that, that was one of our original values, actually, is we must re-earn our position every day in every way. And my father hammered that into us as, as young adults, you know, getting into the workforce. And it still rings. And I'm not you know, physically in a work environment anymore. But no matter what it is that I'm doing, that comes back to mind. Um, I must rear in my position every day in every way. Absolutely. I, I remember, you know, for your for you, it was a car wash for myself. My family business was an independent motel in Florida, not franchise. And I learned to be uh, the switchboard operator, the maid. Every every weekend in summers, I was on the cleaning staff to clean the pool, to paint, to, you know, whatever it took is what you did because your, your livelihood depended on it. And, you know, those are, I think, great lessons, especially as you go into franchising that you can understand and relate to when a franchisee puts it all on the line. And that they have shown value and invested in you as the franchisor because they trust you and they believe in you. And that is an awesome, awesome responsibility. And it's one that can't be taken lightly. That's right. When I watched your interview with your daughter, which was terrific, by the way, I, when you were talking about that, I thought, oh, yeah, I remember the days I had to be the one on Christmas Day to go and suck the water out of the carpet at an apartment community because my dad didn't, didn't want to call. Um, the other technicians, you know, that were off that day and bother their families. And you, you just go and you do it. That's exactly right. So as, as you continued to grow and develop in the family business and life experiences along the way as well, did you ever envision that you were going to be the CEO one day? It was not on my goals list. <laughs> so I do remember my father, you know, always saying to me, um, you're one of the future leaders of this company. And I wasn't sure what that meant. I was already running a real estate division at that point in time. And of course, he wasn't paying me much, but I could make anything I wanted to based on commissions and bonuses. <laughs> but my base salary for running 
I don't know, like a million square feet of real estate was was nothing. And I think I had 28 uh, team members that I was working with. Um, but I just I just remember him saying that one day you're going to you know, be one of the, the leaders of this company. And we all thought he'd live to be 100 because that was his goal. And he died at the age of 60. You know, so he squeezed 100 years of life into 60 because he was so driven. But that was, um, you know, it was really uh, quite a surprise when the outside board of directors of our publicly traded company invited me to be the CEO. And that certainly came with its challenges. It does. So kind of how did you think about preparing for that when when it came time and, you know, you're going to step into that role? You'd been preparing, but then what next? Yeah, I, I guess I when I was first invited, I thought, wow, am I really the right person for this? I, I was honored and I wanted to be given the, the opportunity, but I did, you know, inside say to myself, am I really the right person for this? And I had years of preparation, you know, my, my father and other leaders in the organization planted so many seeds and nurtured those seeds within me, you know, put me in tough situations, which is what makes us very strong, right? It's not the fun stuff that makes us better. It's typically the really hard stuff, the failures that you have to deal with and, and just the really challenging times. So the, the biggest thing I did to prepare was just, I, I just had faith. I mean, I just went into it saying, if I'm the right person, this is going to work out. And to be honest with you, the, the board of directors, we were traded on NASDAQ at the time, publicly traded. And the outside board of directors put me in as the acting uh, president and CEO because I was 35 years old. They had fear of shareholders saying, what are you doing putting the 35-year-old in charge of this company that we just invested in? You know, literally, it's just been public for four, four years, really, uh, on NASDAQ. And yet I said to myself, if I can have the right people around me, I can do this, but I need people's support. And my family, I have five brothers and sisters. I needed to know that they were behind me, and my mother was, was certainly behind me. And then uh, I had to go out and prove to everybody that I could do it. And there's one story, uh, Emma, if you'd like me to tell kind of a the, the first challenge I bumped into, and it was right away. Yes, a group please. of Mr. Yeah, group of Mr. Reuter franchisees um, got together up in the Northeast and they, sorry, Northwest. And they did a straw poll. They weren't asked uh, in their opinion, you know, do you think Dina should be the, the permanent president and CEO? But they decided to do a straw poll and see what the other franchise owners thought. So they voted against me being the, the uh, president and CEO of the company. And the gentleman that kind of rallied the group um, was was a na man named Bruce and ran a very, very good business. He and his wife ran a beautiful Mr. Reuter franchise up in the Northwest. So I had to meet with him because I thought, you know, we hardly know each other. And yet he's rallying the franchisees, top franchisees, um, to not support me going forward. So I remember sitting down with him and it was one of those, uh, you know, I, I asked to meet with him. And we sat down and I'll never forget the sweat balls dripping off of his forehead because <laughs> he's probably thinking, who is this little twit? You know, who, do, who does she think she is asking to meet with me? And I met with him with with the right spirit. You know, I prayed before I went into the meeting and I said, you know, Holy Spirit, just be with me here and help me to to face the truth, but to have the courage to to stand up for myself and for the company. And I said, I understand you did a straw poll. And you all voted against me being the permanent president and CEO. And I'd like to know why. He said, number one, you're not a plumber. He was right. <laughs> he said, number two, you've never run a company this size. Darn it. He was right again. I said, you're right. You're right about both of those things. And then I, I really have to give credit you know, to my faith in the Holy Spirit on this one, because I wasn't smart enough to come up with this answer. But I said, but you know what I am? I'm the customer. When you and your text knock on somebody's door, who answers it? Most of the time. He said, the woman of the house. I said, that's me. I know what the customer wants. And in order for me to succeed, I need you to support me. So for the next six months, because that's really what I'd been given. I'd been given six months as acting president and CEO to prove that I was capable of doing the job. And I said, because if you continue to back talk behind me, it's just going to cause drama. My, my time's going to be spent on putting out fires instead of proving that I'm capable of doing this again with the right team in place. And we had the right people on the bus. We just had to rearrange the bus uh, seats a little bit. And so he said, okay, I'll give you six months. And Bruce became my greatest cheerleader. And unfortunately we lost him to cancer. Um, I don't know, about 10 years after that, probably. 
but that was, oh, I, I was scared. You know, I was scared going into that meeting with him. I don't think I was sweating like he was. So we have to remember everybody's human, right? We're all human and we all have our fears. Um, but I also had to be honest. And he was right about the two things that he said were the reasons that they felt I shouldn't be running the company. You know, that that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Because even, even, I don't care how much experience you have in leadership, you're always looking to grow and develop and you seek uh, mentorship. And there are times where your faith is strong and you know that you're in the right direction. However, sometimes that self-doubt can come in there when things like that happen, that someone else doesn't have the same faith in you that you have in yourself and how you go about kind of coming to some common ground and being able to know that in your heart, you're doing the right things. Because at the end of the day, it is all about the customer and business. And that's what makes successful brands and companies. And, and you certainly have, uh, through those experiences, developed some values that, that I'll talk about here in a bit. And so, you know, every choice is a chance. You know, you, you made a choice to take the interim role as CEO and president with that six month window. You know, what were some of the important choices that you made that impacted you know, the outcomes, like you mentioned building a team, where did you go to start to build that team since you were so young in your career? Yeah. Like I said, the team really was already there. The core um, executive team was really already in place. In fact, Robert Tunmeyer had been the CEO of the company and he was an ex-brother-in-law of mine. So I had been working for him and the outside board. We, we took him out of franchise development. He was the real driver of franchise development. Um, when, when my father passed away and then we thought he had the most experience to be put in the CEO role after my father's passing, but it devastated franchise development because he's really the guy who, that was his ministry. That was his life is helping people have the chance to own their own business. And he really thrived in that area as CEO, you know, he's dealing with public shareholders. He's dealing with all of us. And, you know, we, we had a family of five, we were the largest shareholders. So Robert had a tough job cut out for him. So Robert then went back into franchise development. And I want to say what a gentleman he was to go from being my boss to being one of my greatest supporters uh, when that transition happened. That doesn't always happen. Even in friendly organizations, that doesn't always happen. So he and, and Mike Biddle and my sister, Debbie Hood and we had a chief financial officer and we had a wonderful Duke Johnson in our um, uh, legal department. So we already had this core team. Again, we just had to make sure they're on the right seats of the bus. So I was blessed. I was blessed that there were already people that were so good at what they did and they were willing to, to work side by side with me. That's, that's amazing. And you're right. That doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. I think that goes back and speaks to the culture that your dad started within the organization and that you certainly picked up that torch and carried on. And, you know, I know that in 2005, you wrote the book, Live Rich. And then in 2015, The Values, Inc. And I think this is a good time to talk about that, you know, developing that culture within your organization and then penning that for others to, to learn and grow from. So where did that idea come from? Yeah, my father was a, a great student of leaders. He loved studying great leaders, whether they were church leaders, business leaders. Um, and what he learned about those leaders is they all had clarity of their values. So that was the number one thing that he discovered is they all knew what they stood for, right? And they shared what they stood for with everybody that was part of their team or even people that they did business with. So when he founded the company in 1981, he founded it with a clear code of values. Back then, they were really more emotionally based beliefs because they were really hard to measure. Uh, like I mentioned, the one we must re-earn our positions every day in every way. You know, so that's kind of an internal thing. I have to measure whether or not I'm really living up to that. Could he really, you know, say I was or I wasn't? Well, I guess somewhat he could, but it was subjective. So his original values were more subjective. And when he passed away of a sudden heart attack at the age of 60 in 1994, after just taking the company public on NASDAQ, <laughs> you know, our biggest fear as a leadership team was, is how do we keep this culture special? I got moved into the role of VP of ops and I was put in charge of how do we do this? How do we keep the values front and center? Now that Don Dwyer is no longer here 
to hold us accountable because he'd let you know, right? <laughs> You're doing a great job today living up to this value, but you know, you could use some work on this one. So we hired an outside uh, consulting firm to come in and we looked at the original values and we operationalized them. So basically we created a set of core values under the, the four areas of respect, integrity, customer focus, and having fun in the process. And that's where the rich comes from, the acronym rich. But below each one of those core areas, we also said, what does it mean to be respectful? We want to be specific about how we hold ourselves accountable to that. So treating others as we'd like to be treated, listening with the intent to understand what is being said, and acknowledging that what is said is important to the speaker. A really important one for our company is speaking calmly and respectfully without profanity or sarcasm. So we we call those values, but some might call those operational accounting, uh, sorry, accountability statements. So it took us about a year to bring those into the organization, about 125 employees back then in 1996, brought the team together, said, we, we think we know how we can keep the culture special based on the values. We're going to operationalize the values, gave them a card that had the original values on one side and the new values on the other side. And we said, for the next 90 days, we're going to gamify the values. <laughs> we need you team to hold the leadership team accountable to the values because we haven't proven to you that we're, we're good at these yet. So for the next 90 days, anytime you find a leadership team member violating one of the values, we want your feedback. And the feedback came in the form of a simple beep. Emma, I don't know about you, but I'm all about let's keep it as simple as we can. And so we kept it so simple. And the employees studied those values even better than I would have expected because they, they had permission to catch us doing something wrong. That's kind of nice. You know, you get to get the boss's <laughs> feedback. Oops, they're asking for feedback. Um, so it was it was a lot of there was a lot of beeping for 90 days. You know, I tease that it was like the Roadrunner was racing through our buildings because we were so bad at those values. But the good news is the employees cared. We brought them back together after the 90 day beep game. And we said, what do you think? They said, we love it. We think these are the right solutions. These are the right values. But they added one that today I think is still probably the toughest for most people. And that's never saying anything about anyone that you would not say to him or her. I know, I know it's one I've got to work on, right? It kind of falls into the area of gossip. And sometimes, um, you know, I find that I, I talk more than I need to talk and instead of just having a direct conversation with an individual or holding my tongue. So that's when the employees actually asked if we could add, which is beautiful. I mean, they contributed to these values. And to today, uh, Mike Bidwell and the leadership team um, are striving to live the values. None of us are perfect. We will never be perfect. Um, so the truth is we're going to make mistakes. And there's unfortunately going to be times when people don't have the best experience with me or with somebody else that represents the company. But all we can do is our best and then work hard to correct it if we can. I really admire how you how you noted that we were terrible at it. The leadership was terrible in, in initially in the values. I mean, to, that's what great leaders do, though. They recognize and can be humble enough to say, hey, you know, we have a lot that we have to work on, yet still learning and growing with the rest of the staff. And I think that's one of the many things that has made Neighborly such a special place um, and the impact that the, the organization has had far beyond your walls into all of franchising. I, I, I really don't know that anyone can fully digest. And I'm not sure anyone at Neighborly uh, even as well. I was at a leadership summit recently up in Minneapolis and one of the brand presidents for Neighborly was on a panel. And, you know, I, I saw that and immediately wanted to make sure that I could attend that session. Mm -hmm. I know that anytime someone from Neighborly is speaking, they are, they are living the values and they're in, and they're, their contributions you always learn from. And so I, I really admire that that how deep and wide it has gone just beyond your four walls. Thank you. We we do have great people that represent the company. Yeah. So I, kind of a off the wall question. My pastor once did a sermon that everyone, and I would even expand it to say every organization needs four type of people in the organization or in, or in their life. A cheerleader, a counselor, a chaplain, and a challenger. As you think about you, how you have grown, and they change over time, but 
As you were uh, leading the company, who would those four individuals have been for you? I actually have a board member that came to mind right away when you said cheerleader, and that's Steve Siegel. Steve Siegel was the first franchisee to become chairman of the IFA. And Steve mm -hmm. joined our board. Um, oh, I can't give you the exact date, but it would have been in 2000, I'm thinking six-ish, 2005, somewhere around then. And, and he was such a cheerleader. He and my sister, Debbie, I guess. But Debbie also, um, there was another one that you said, challenger. <laughs> she, uh, she is uh, not afraid to give honest feedback to her sister. And so in my leadership role, I really appreciated the fact that she would be tough on me. Right. And uh, that's not easy to do with a sibling. It's not easy to do with somebody who's not a sibling, but she wasn't afraid to give me the feedback I needed to hear that, that, that sometimes I didn't want to hear. So I would say she was a good challenger along with Robert Tunmeyer, who was the ex-brother-in-law that used to be the CEO. He was never afraid to give me uh, his honest feedback. And we can laugh about some of those things because anyways, you know how those stories go. <laughs> okay. What were the other two? Counselor and a chaplain. Oh, I had, a, a, again, another wonderful private equity partner, um, Stuart Baxter with the Riverside Company. That was our first private equity partner. And then also our third <laughs> private equity partner. They actually came back and bought us for a second time. And Stu Baxter just... Um, in a very, very sincere and generous way would give me great counsel. I could call him with tough situations and tough situations that involved his company, right? He, he was the, the lead partner um, during that time on our, our board. And I always could trust that he was going to listen to me and give me his, his best feedback. And many times it was different than what I thought we should do. But I appreciate that I, was, I had somebody who was listening to me Really, they really heard me, but they also gave me uh, honest feedback. And last one, a chaplain. Oh, goodness. You mentioned Melanie Bergeron earlier. Yeah. And Melanie, um, I could always go to Melanie. Uh, she's a, a woman of faith. And I could yeah. always get, you know, honest counsel from Melanie as, as if you want to call it chaplaincy. And also my my um, executive assistant, Carol Dugod. Carol still works for me five hours a week right now because, you know, I still get a lot of emails that I, I, I'm not the best person to touch. So she takes care of those. But Carol was such a confidant, you know, to be a publicly traded company, to be working with um, somebody day in and day out that I could just give her my greatest fears. And she would give me just great, thoughtful counsel. Um but again, in a very faithful sense, you know, she was very spiritually in touch with um, what's what's right, what's not right. I, you know, I found over the years, my pastor did that sermon, it's been some years ago, and I immediately took notes and, and I have found that my perspective in life and in business, it, that, that has remained to be true. And some people say, well, why do you want to challenge her? you know, in, in, in any role. And I'm like, that's the best. That's where great growth comes. And each of those individuals play a, a key role in, in growing. And I, and I mean myself growing into a better wife, a better mother, a better, better leader, you know, whatever roles though, those that you have, I, I really have found that to be pretty solid um, counsel and, and insight from, my pastor in the pulpit. So <laughs> that's, that's a great question. And before I forget, actually, my, my greatest cheerleader is my husband. So my husband, no matter what I was going through, he would, he would support me and be behind me. And he's, he's a quiet guy. Um, but he, he was always behind me. And, and sometimes I, I thought, really, do I deserve um, this, whatever it is, this positive support, but he would always support me in my role um, with the company. I met Mike on that bike trip. That That's we took right. In that, in that harrowing terrain. Um, <laughs> I had not been on a trail ride in so many years, but I did meet Mike. And you could tell he is very supportive. And, and I would just highlight that, you know, as I said, you and I have been in this for a long time. You were you were leading a company as a working wife and mother. And 
how, and Mike was your biggest cheerleader, as you said, how did you balance the roles though? And I think our audience would really like to understand that because so many are young women that are, that are listening today. It takes time to figure that out. And I'm not sure we ever get balance. You know, I, I think about having peace and harmony in our lives. And I actually teach a, a course. I still teach it today, but I used to teach it to all new franchisees and associates uh, every month. And we have basic training. It's called Design Your Life, Living by um, Design, Not by Default. And one of the exercises is the wheel of life, right? So if you think about our lives, there's basically six areas. There's family, financial, social, physical, career, and spiritual. And so I get people to to rate those spokes on their wheel of life. And then you pretty much connect the dots. I'm sorry, I keep being reminded to give blood. And, <laughs> and I need to do that, but I don't think it's today. Um, <laughs> but the wheel of life, you, you find out where your flats are when you do this little, this simple exercise. And so I encourage people to think about the areas where you've got a little flat going on, you know, how do you boost those up? And normally it means you've got to take something from one area of life to sacrifice for another area of life to be more fruitful. And I give an example of when I became a president and CEO, I really was afraid to accept the job initially because I was traveling so much already. And I was spending so much time away from my husband and my young, my young children. And I said, I really am not willing to sacrifice more time away from them. So how can I possibly accept the job of CEO and have more expect to have more time with my kids. But when you think about your wheel of life and you think about where you spend your time, money and energy, I quickly realized that and I did this time study that 15 hours of my week was spent on household related chores. I don't have to do those things, right? I don't love cleaning the toilet. I like a clean toilet, but I don't have to be the one cleaning it. So Mike and I decided we were going to invest in our, our family's time together by hiring a housekeeper. And thanks be to God for Isabel. Here we are 24 years later, and she still tends to our family and our home so that we can go do other things that are more relational uh, with our family and our friends. So that's what I did. And I had more time with my family as I became CEO than I had had as chief op or as a VP of operations prior to that. Now that didn't always stay that way, right? Things happened. We went and made an acquisition. So things got really busy and I didn't have that extra time. And then I brought it back into a semblance of balance again. So you have to kind of go with the ebbs and the flows because that does happen. But overall, I had this wonderful peace of mind. In fact, it was probably one of the most happy times of my life um, because I figured out how to try to make it all work. Now, I don't know what my kids would say. Um, I would go to school and have lunch with them. So instead of going to lunch for a business meeting, I'd go sit in those tiny little chairs and eat tater tots with them in elementary school. You know, you make the choices. I, I remember hearing Alex interview you and Alex is like, mom, I wouldn't have had you do it any other way. Because you did think about me. You did give me your time. And you know what? I don't want too much of your time when I'm a teenager. I just want enough. <laughs> that is so true. And I can remember there were some trips where the important things, if if I I would, I literally would take, you know, flights at odd times, like just to make sure I was home. I would do a day trip. Of course, back then, you know, it was, I will say air travel was a little bit easier. I had a lot more options out of Cincinnati for uh, in and outs. Don't quite have that today, but so grateful when I did, because I could leave my house and be in my office, wherever my office was, because my office was not in Cincinnati at the time. And sometimes do a trip back at time to be at seven o'clock game. Um, if it was an important game, whatever that looked like. But I think you do, you would just work real hard to find that balance. And you set, you you have are so blessed, at least I was same, to have individuals around me, whether they were family, friends, or individuals like Isabel that you hire to kind of pick up that gap. And and it 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 does end up working out all at the end. And I, I don't think I, I do think that uh we get what we're what God's plan is for us, you know, that that's where we, that's where we lead. So, you know, you've had numerous successes over the years, of which I highlighted some in, in the beginning. So conversely, and this is a pretty, you know, typical question, what would you say is your proudest moment? And then what are, what was one of your hardest lessons you learned? Yeah, the proudest moment is, comes easy. Uh, when we were still publicly traded, but we knew that wasn't the right 
place for us to be, right? We were working so hard and the, the market just wasn't giving us any appreciation of our stock for all the work that was being put in. And we were thinly traded. So, you know, I get it. So we went from being public to private and our family back then, it was, the company was much smaller back then. This is in 2004. And, and I mentioned the Riverside uh, private equity group who came in and our family did make um, a nice amount of money from the stock sale. And we met as a family. We said, we need to reward our team members. We would not be here today if it weren't for our team members. And our family, my mother included, collectively said, this is what we want to do. And I, I won't talk about the, the numbers, but we gave a substantial part of the monies that we received from that sale back to our employees. And it wasn't just about the employee who had the biggest position in the company. It was about tenure. Because if they were still with us, that meant they were loyal, right? We weren't just going to keep people, just to keep people, right? They were people that were loyal. Um, so it was tenure. And we um, just said for every year of their employment with us, they're going to get X amount of dollars per year. And the funnest day was when my mother got to sit there. We let her do it. She was the, um, I think she was still in the chairman's position in the company or co-chairman. And we handed those checks out to the team members. Um, and, and then just, just about four years ago, we hired a estate planning attorney to help facilitate um, these meetings that we have with my, my brothers and sisters. We actually have a family limited partnership. And so we meet every 90 days and this facilitator, one of the first questions he asked us was, I'm going to have you divide into groups of three and you're going to go off and you're going to come back to me with what is the story that you're most proud of as a family? Every group came back with the same exact story that I just told you. And that's what we're now telling our children and my mom's great grandchildren, that this is what we're most proud of, that we we know that we're only a small part of the success of our lives, right? Whether it's as a mom, a wife, or a, a leader of a company, it takes, we talk about taking a village, but it definitely does take a village to make things happen. It does. So what was your hardest lesson? Uh, and I keep making the mistake or I kept making the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there are a lot. So there's a yeah. lot. Um, but I would say to you, not listening to my gut when there's a, a, a decision that needs to be made in the organization or in life and my gut saying, this is what you need to do. And yet my mind saying, oh no, let's do this or let's try that. Or, let's give this benefit of the doubt. Let's get that. I'm big on benefit of the doubt, right? Um, but there are two occasions in particular that I don't want to get into details about. One had to do with an individual who didn't belong on our team. And other people thought he should stay on the team because he really knew this side of the business and he knew he had to make money on this side of the business. But in the meantime, he was the bull in the China shop, wrecking relationships, right? With other team members and franchisees because he was not living up to the core values. And meeting after meeting after meeting, trying to build him up and trying to support him and get him there, it just wasn't happening. And I'm not saying he was a bad guy. I think he's a guy with a good heart, but he had just some some challenges um, in leadership for whatever reason that just didn't fit with our company. So it took me too long to make a decision on that particular one. So not, not going with my gut when my gut's just really strong about something and then me not listening. I would say that I would share that same lesson. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it when you're a leader and you live with a code of values and you do provide, I, I use the word grace mm -hmm. a, a lot, um, being able to really believe in the best of people. And I think people inherently want to do well. They want to do good. Sometimes they, though, you just don't have the right seat on the bus. And that's right. I'm, I'm right there with you. So I know that you also appeared, and I've seen the episode several times uh, on Undercover Boss. So tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and did anything surprise you? Now, first of all, I wasn't invited to be on that. We had to go to them and say, we think we're a company that you'd be interested in. You know, here's a woman running a male dominated business and she'd like to go undercover to find out are the values really at work on the front lines? Because for years, I really did want to do that. I wanted to go out on the trucks with the frontline team members and experience. Are they really giving the customer um, the experience by the values that we hope that they would be giving? So we reached out to Studio Lambert at the time. So I would like to say to all the listeners is, don't be afraid to go ask. 
do your homework though. We did our homework. I have a wonderful publicist, Monica Vide with BizCom, who helped us do the research on did any of the other episodes, any of the other CEOs really get into values? And I think out of 36 episodes that were previewed, maybe two bosses even used the word values in their episodes for the first two seasons. So we knew uh, it would be different and to be something that we, we thought that the production company would be interested in. And sure enough, they were. So I prayed a lot. Uh, once they gave us the green light that this was, um, they wanted the Dwyer group to be involved. And I'm like, God, just keep me humble. This is not about me. This is about this wonderful organization that we represent that has about a foundation of values that is what's caused us to be successful or helped us to be successful with great people following those values. So when they asked me, CBS asked me to come up with an undercover name. They said, we need it to be a name that you're not going to forget because we've had bosses that have ruined a full day of filming because they end up saying, oh, hi, I'm Dina. <laughs> you know, So <laughs> I got to thinking about all these names that I might would have liked to have been named. And then finally I said, okay, forget all that. What's going to keep me focused and humble? And I thought faith. So I went to CBS and said, okay, four potential names, Faith Brown, Faith White, Faith Black, Faith Jones. And they they were able to pass Faith Brown. I guess it was a name that not had been had not been used because they worried about, you know, being sued by having somebody else's name. And so the entire episode, you know, I'm being called by faith. And, and there's story after story. I mean, we probably don't have time for it today, but I will tell you, there were so many literal signs that happened along the way that were all faith related, but it was, a, it was an amazing experience. We have incredible franchisees and team members and they work so hard. Those people that are on the front lines that are climbing in your attic to fix your air conditioning so you can be comfortable are amazing people. I mean, the ones that are out on the street, you know, anyways, it's, it was a great experience. Oh, sorry. Forgot to shut alarms. <laughs> That's okay. I, you know, I, you're, you're right, Dina, we could, we may have to do a part two because in interest of, of your time, I want to be very respectful of that. Just a couple of more questions. If you had three pieces of, three pieces of advice for young women who are entering business today and franchising today, what would it be? Number one, have clarity of your personal values. So there's organizational values, but you need to understand what you stand for. Know your values. For me, my number one value is my faith. And I have certain rules and rituals that support that area of my faith. For example, this morning, I was up, and in my case, I was at Mass at 7 a.m. this morning, and then I stayed for adoration for a full hour. Just that classroom of silence, getting quiet with God, and again, keeping things in perspective is critical. I don't know what it is for you all, the listeners out there, but no what your values are. And if you want to go to dinadwyerowens.com, I actually have a Create Your Culture workbook. You don't have to do the whole workbook if you don't want, but just pick the page that gives you a chance to circle all the values that are most important to you. And then take those, maybe take the top two and think about what are the things that I do day in and day out that's proof that I'm living this value. And then make sure that you're doing those things day in and day out. Don't get off course, stay on course with those values. So when you think about the franchise organization that you're leading, then what are your organizational values? So take it to the next step if you're actually the one leading that company, or if you're going to work for a franchise organization, go to work for one that is aligned with your values. There are so many choices of where you can work today. Don't go somewhere that their values are completely not aligned with yours. You'll be miserable and life's too short. So number one, know your values and then work hard to live those every day. We'll all make mistakes, right? Things get busy. Life gets busy. We forget our own values sometimes because we get caught up in the busy. So you've got to make sure you do that. Um, number two is to plan and prioritize your time, your money, and your energy. And if you know what your values are, it's a lot easier to do that. So many times we blame people or things for us not achieving where we want to be in our lives. But then when we take an honest look at what we're doing with our time, our money, and our, and our energy, and we're honest with ourselves, we're the problem. Let's not blame it on anybody else. We're the problem. So have clarity of your values and then plan and prioritize your time, your money, and your energy. And you know what? You, you can get so good at this. It only takes a half an hour a week to think about next week. What are the most important things that I need to achieve to get closer to my personal, my professional goals? And put those on the calendar. And don't let any excuses get in the way or distractions get in the way of you achieving those, unless it's a true emergency, a family you know, issue or something like that. Good. 
So in looking back, what would you tell your 12 year old self? Knowing my 12 what you know. My 12 year old self. And I picked 12 because I know that's the age that you started working in the family business. Well, I would remind myself that you can do anything um, that you put your mind to if you're willing to work hard enough. I was a very heavy 12 year old. I think I was 125 pounds at 12, but you know what? I was a happy, heavy <laughs> 12 year old. So my sister came home from a, a field trip and she brought me a, a magnet that said, fat is where it's at. I ran to my room and cried so hard, but I looked in the mirror and I saw the triple chin and I thought, I am fat, aren't I? And you know what? I'm not saying that we have to be skinny minis. I'm just saying I wasn't taking care of myself. I was eating the um, back back then. I guess McDonald's was um, offering the Big Mac and they didn't, hadn't even done the big fries yet. But I would do the Big Mac and the fries and then I would have either a shake or an apple pie with it at 12 years old. So I decided I was going to start exercising and I was just going to eat half of what I had been eating. And that summer, you know, my my body changed and I felt so much better. So I would just say that that's an example, but you could, you can do anything you put your mind to if you're willing to, to put the work behind it. Okay. And lastly, just a couple of speed questions. What, whatever comes to your mind first, <laughs> what's something you're obsessed with right now? Listening to a podcast called Bible in the Year by Father Mike Schmitz. Okay. What's your favorite word? Love. What's your least favorite word? Hate. Your guiltiest pleasure? Chocolate. <laughs> and then lastly, because you and I have talked about being women of faith, when you leave this world and you arrive at the pearly gates, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive? Well done, my good and faithful servant just gave me chills because that's I, I was asked that question once mm -hmm. and that was the exact same answer that I gave well Dina I got a lot of work I got a lot of work to do but well yes we all do we all do and our pastor this last week talked about what you know we all talk about legacy and think about it in terms of the legacy that we live leave for our children and the legacy we might leave for the companies that we found or what is your spiritual legacy going to be? So I think that's a, another question worth exploring. But in the interest of time, uh, I really want to thank you for joining me today and sharing your story with, with our audience. And more than anything, I would just like to thank you for leading the way for so, so many uh, and, and getting to positions uh, in leadership and doing it through a strong code of values that it just has spoke volumes to so many. So really appreciate it. I know our audience is going to love listening to, to our time today, and we may have to follow up in another season with a round two. Thank you, Emma. And I'm, I've been so blessed by the International Franchise Association and all the amazing people like you that I've had a chance to meet and get to know. It truly is an extended family, and I just feel blessed. Thank you. Thank you.